All right, welcome to another episode of To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Today, my guest, freelance drummer, Carl Ciadella. How What's you doing, up? Carl? I'm doing great. How are you? I am fantastic, man. Enjoying the day. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you about drums and Kiss and Van Halen. Star oh, Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> you know I love Star Wars, man. Me too, me too. Especially like the original. I'm a big a Ridge Tridge fan, you know. Oh yeah, like, because I'm I was born in '71, so you know I saw it at the theater, episode four. So not to show my age, but oh man, I'm jealous. Yeah, well, I think that has a lot to do with how you feel about the movies when you saw them in your life. You know, like if if you were a kid in '99 or 2003 and you saw those the 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 prequels, then I guess those would be more special to you because I think kids. Uh, that saw the prequels, I think the original ones would bore them to a certain extent because there's not as much action, there's more dialogue, you know what I mean? Then It's like the, the prequels are like video games almost with all the... Yeah, all the CGI and mm-hmm. the craziness going on. Yeah. The originals are such better stories, though, man. I mean, it's really, it's a, a classic. It's not even, it was sort of good versus evil, but like both right. sides really feel like they're doing the best thing for the galaxy and... You know, it kind of gives you that whole perspective of uh, the good versus evil argument. Absolutely, characters were better too. I think characters oh, had time. more more depth to them and and uh, more of an arc. Yeah. You know? Um. So yeah. Yeah, I'm a big original trilogy fan myself. I usually watch the original release, like the 1977 version of Episode Four. Right. I have uh, I have copies of all three of those that are still they're just fantastic. I mean, the, those movies won. Uh, special effects awards uh, those yeah, years sound, and right? sound awards. Ben Burr, I think his name was. Yeah, it was fantastic what they did uh, for for the times, sure. and they still hold up today. I mean, of course, the videos that they remastered look great, but they it it kind of changes the whole vibe of the movie. All that extra right. CGI they added in, right? Absolutely, and, and to me, they stuck out. Some people said, "Well, I couldn't even tell what was there before and what wasn't." You talk about the special editions, right? Yeah. To me, they stuck out. They, Big and time. He, and he added stuff that was just unnecessary. You know, putting a rock in front of R two D two. How does that? How does that better the story? You know what I mean? Or, or, or I don't know. Enhance it. I just didn't get it. I think he was just. He, I don't think he needed money, but I mean, I just think he was just bored and looking for ways to reissue these things with new footage or whatever. And oh yeah. You know, and uh, and for me, I mean, that's when I really got. I mean, I've always been into it my whole life, but I was born in '85. So when the special editions came out, it was like this big reintroduction. I was able to go see all the movies in theaters. Right, right. That's right. when I started like getting all the toys and everything, collecting it all. But um, you know, uh, when I went back to the '77 uh, version of Episode Four, uh-huh. like especially when they're in Tatooine, man, and it's just so desolate. Like right. when they're walking through that town, there's not freaking Jawas falling off of big monsters right. and all that stuff going on. It's really desolate and dull and the sand's blowing. And then you make it into the cantina. Oh, that's where everybody is because right. it's the freaking desert. So everyone's inside it's drinking. It's the only place to go. Yeah. You know, unless they're flying out of somewhere or something. But yeah, for sure. For sure. That, yeah. And that all feeds into the story. And then when you change that, it's just, I don't know. It's just... It, takes away from it i think you know it does but there's a lot of people out there who love those versions so i guess it's all personal opinion you know what you like is what you like and uh did you get the uh the specialized version of those movies what do you mean the specialized version they're uh if you go on ebay they're called the the despecialized version it's um i believe they took because this is when you could when you couldn't buy the original versions on on dvd um they took I think it from the laser discs, the original movies from laser discs and they enhanced those, but they didn't add the extra footage. They enhanced the picture and the, and the sound, but they kept the original story or the original, I'm sorry, the original, uh, prints or whatever of them. So a lot of people, I don't have those, but I heard they're, they're really cool. Despecialized edition. Yep. Oh, you can just go watch it. They're free to watch. I think so. I, I couldn't. Here's archive.org. I actually have a website pulled up real quick. I can oh, show you? you here. Yeah, archive.org slash Star Wars Despecialized Edition. I can't push play, obviously, on right, this. Right. But, uh, yeah, you can you can download it right here. Oh, that's cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think they, 
enhanced just the the picture and the sound, but it's the it's the original version of it, it the best quality you can get. You know, that's, that's available. awesome. So I'm gonna have to look into getting a nice version of that that I like. I know also there was um, what was it they. They did the prequels where they cut all the bullshit out or they, like, chopped it into, like, a reasonable movie at some point. There the, was that... The, the Jar Jar they took out? They or? took... Yeah, people <laughs> took out all the Jar Jar bullshit. And, okay, I haven't seen those. I yeah, haven't heard of those. I think that's one of the things you can watch on YouTube where they cut all the prequels into, like, two hours and they're like, here's... They them cooler. Here's the information you need from the prequels without wasting six and a half hours of your life or whatever right, it ends right. up being. No. What did you think of the new ones, man? Uh, I was excited... Uh, when um uh what was the first one called <laughs> right I, uh it was rise of skywalker there's the last jedi and the first one was um empire this, strikes back <laughs> too <laughs> exactly this tells you a lot about how, how i feel about him can't remember the name of it yeah i can't either uh right. the force awakens the force awakens i was excited at first it was you know, especially because you know they had harrison ford coming back and everything but i what happened to me is when i saw in the theater it was so bizarre. I'm sitting there, and my girl, my fiance Marie, she 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 likes the prequels for some reason, you know, and she's like my age, so I don't understand it. But <laughs> she likes the love story between, uh, uh, you know, Padme and Anakin. Yes, yep. So anyway, so we're watching it, and all of a sudden, when you see Harrison Ford and you see Carrie Fisher, you realize, man, I'm getting old, because like, because you know, Harrison Ford was my hero as a kid. You know, Han Solo. I used to dress, dress up as Han Solo when I was mm-hmm. six years old, and we used to play around the block and sh- you know shoot each other. And, and I'm looking at him, going, mm-hmm. man, it's just he's old, and I feel old. And it kind of like bummed me out. But I, but I, I did like the Force Awakens. I thought was the, was the best one out of the three. Yeah. But the other ones, eh, I just I don't know. I just couldn't get into it. Yeah, the I whole series it. was a little. I thought I thought. Uh, what they did with the third one after they kind of wrote themselves they kept getting new people to write it new people to direct it and right after the episode eight right the second one of the final trilogy it was like there was this huge hole they had written themselves into yeah and it, there's a lot of stuff that they hadn't explained properly yeah and then they did their damnedest on the third one i thought to kind of put it all in a nice package and yeah tie it off the bow and uh, yeah, they did. I thought they did a decent enough job of that, where well, they they JJ ended it fixed properly, it yeah, as much as he could. And, you know, it seems like you know JJ did the first one, then the second one. It's almost like he he ignored everything because I guess JJ had uh, plans or a, an outline of what he wanted to do for the next movie. And um, what's the director for the second for the other director? <laughs> you gotta look it yeah, up. Yeah, nice. uh, you uh, That's exactly what it is, right? Uh, I just don't like those movies that much. I think I've seen them all once. Yeah, me too. Me too. I didn't buy them or anything. Uh, I can't remember the director for the second. Hang one. on a second. Up. I'm getting it right now. I'm off the interwebs here. Uh, Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson. Right. Yeah. So he. It seems like he ignored everything that JJ wanted to do and took it in his direction and as a result it was just all over the place and then the third one JJ seemed like he had to put it all back together as best as he could because he killed killed Snoke in the second one right and that was going till everybody wanted to know who is this guy where is he from and all of a sudden he's dead you know and then like <laughs> and so he was like, okay JJ here you go figure out what you're gonna do uh, so that's funny yeah, I guess Ryan Johnson did stuff like uh, Knives Out, Looper. What else did yeah. he do that I like? Oh, Breaking Bad. Yeah, he, he did, did some, some good he stuff. He did some Breaking Bad, three episodes of that. And he did so, some. Yeah, I guess he's done some pretty decent stuff. But, yeah, those, I mean, Star Wars is such... I, I think the problem with it is we all hold it in such high esteem. Yeah. Like, those first three movies, especially the first two. Like, Jedi was great, but, you know, the, all the Ewoks fighting giant robots is kind of like, okay. Right, right. Unbelievable. Kind yeah. Of uh, the whole fate of the universe depends on Ewoks beating up the Empire for a second. I, they should have done Wookiees. That would have been cool. If it yeah. was Wookiees, that, was, that would be believable that they took down the Empire. Instead of, but, you know, I think he at that point he wanted to sell toys. That's what he was doing. That's yeah. where all his money was coming from. Aiming at the, uh, the you know, ten year olds, whatever. Yeah, man, they did a good uh, job of uh, Kashyyyk on the third one, right? They went back and he, yeah. Yoda was hanging out with yep. Chewie, and 
Yep. They had a pretty cool battle sequence there, man. Which looked a lot like um, the holiday special. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. They, they showed Kashyyyk on the holiday special when you go back to Jabaka's house. Oh, that holiday special is absurd. I watch it every year Do for you? Christmas. Just, oh, yeah. Angela hates it. She's just like, <laughs> oh, my God, we got to put this piece of shit back on. And I'm like, well, I have to, it's a tradition. You have to watch the, well, the yeah, worst thing ever it's, made. It's campy. It's very, it's, you know, it's like Kiss Meets the Phantom. Yeah, it's like yeah. campy, but... Uh, the Harvey Corman part is just unbelievable in that, that where he's cooking. Oh, Remember, God, he's, yeah. He's dressed in drag. He, has all, he has all the arms. Yeah, that's so bizarre. The yeah. first, like, 20 minutes, there's not even dialogue. It's just Wookiees Noises. barking at yeah. each other. I can't. I don't know how high George Lucas was when he wrote that movie, but he was very high. He's definitely doing something, uh, you know. He was out there for sure. Yeah, that thing is ridiculous. I, uh... I love the Star Wars Christmas special, though. But I, I recommend everybody watch it. Oh, I yeah. Think you, should, you know, watch it at Christmas time. Maybe uh, do whatever you do to relax and, and put it on. On May the 4th, I always say it's a part of uh, in between episode four and episode five. Yeah, I got to watch the Christmas special. Cause <laughs> and you make your wife sit through it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anyways, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, Sin City Kiss? You guys just played a show over at uh, Counts Vamp May yeah. 8th. Yeah, we... Um, we did a, um, well, in 2020, because obviously everything was shut down, so we did do a, um, a, a New Year's show in Arizona at, oh. at a, the Wicopa Casino in Arizona, and um, it was great. It was a little bit of a long drive, but we got there, and they gave us, we all had our own room for two nights, because we had to get there. They wanted us to get there th that day and, and set up and play that night. It was like, no, we, we need a day to get there and set up. Yeah. you know comfortably and get some rest so um they took care of us you know they gave us we all had our room we got there we set up and then the next day we did a sound check like 11 in the morning and it was very comfortable um played you know they i think they had like 50 percent capacity though for that for that night for new year's and um so we did that show and then we the next show was counts vamped which was last saturday how'd that go it was, it was great it was packed and that's that's actually the first time I think I met you is when you were doing sound. You were a sound guy there. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember when I first met you, you were kind of quiet. I'm like, I don't know if this guy's cool or not cool. And But then once I started I talking was, to you. I was high. No, okay, that's what it was. <laughs> 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 I knew there had to be an explanation somewhere. Uh, but, but, yeah, it went great. We had, we had a great time. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we took pictures for 30 minutes with people afterwards. And, uh, and, of course, I had to work the next day. You know, everybody else in the band has – they work, they're off Saturday, Sundays. I'm the only, you know, guy that has to work weekends because I, I work at Mandalay Bay, I'm a bartender, so I get different days off all the time, and so I had to get up the next day and go to work, which is a little tough, but caffeine does wonders, you know? It does. So, yeah, but other than that, um, we have a show coming up June 5th, I think it is, at AC, have you heard of AV? AV Vegas, it's called? Yeah, of course, yeah, I've, I've heard of AV Vegas. They got the streaming thing going on, right? You know, I don't know a lot about it. What is it, what's it all about? Is it, uh, they do club? a big live stream. No, it's a it's a production uh, warehouse. Oh, really? And they have this huge setup and a really nice stage. And, uh, yeah, they do live streaming. Okay. And so it'll be a, a nice, like, film production that you guys are going to put together. But there's some, I think they're selling tickets for it, though. Yeah, they, uh, I, they started letting people in for, like, the crowd response and everything like that. Oh, okay. And then they were able to, I think, start selling tickets. I'm not I'm not a expert on the... The deal. Yeah. I went over there with um, Mark Broughton from Foundry, okay. and I went and helped them do a show with uh, the AV Vegas crew. Okay. Uh, and yeah, we had they had like I don't know, 30, 50 people somewhere in, in there, yeah. hanging out in the warehouse watching the show. And that's cool. Yeah, it was is is groovy. They got a great setup going on over there. Dude, great, that's good to know. Great team. Yeah. So you you you'd be in good hands. Great. Yeah. So I think that's June fifth. And uh, who knows after that, you know, um, I'm trying to think. I also, uh, I played another Kiss tribute with Scotty Griffin. Uh, I love Kiss, Scotty. Kiss this. Scotty, yeah, he's, he's, he's a funny dude. He's a character, man. He's a rock star for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, so we got our own, another little thing going on there. We do, most of our shows are out of town, though, with that, you know, so. Yeah, you guys just did the Rockstar Bar. That was yeah. my that was my first uh, that was my first day at the Rockstar Bar. Was Kiss Which, This and then Scotty and the Griffins. Yeah, Scotty and the Griffins. Yeah. yeah, we're the Griffins, I guess. I'm I'm one of the Griffins. 
uh, I was impressed with that place. The stage is really, it was the cleanest stage I've ever seen. You know, there's not one speck of, of lint on the ground. I'll give it time. Yeah, right. It's true. It's, and wood from this drumsticks. Uh, but yeah, so I, I really like that place. It's a, you know, how many people does that place hold? Like 200 or 150? Yeah, probably something like that. Like 200, 150 something. It might even be a little higher than 200 once the the restrictions are dropped. Sure. But it's a good it's a good spot, and the guys running it are, uh, are the guys that own it are they're nice guys, and they really yeah. want to they want to do something cool. So I, I'm I'm super down to help them do something cool with the uh, the rock scene out here, man. Absolutely, and they give us a nice big dressing room downstairs. You know, you had, oh yeah, they have that elevator down there, right? Yeah, plenty of room to get ready, which is rare. You know, so I, I really dug it there. I hope you play there again sometime. Yeah, I'm sure you will, man. You guys had a great turnout, and it was a great show. I dig the the kiss this thing that you're doing, man. Yeah. It's the uh, it's it's supposed to be, if I'm not mistaken, like the original like '70s kind of like die barish kiss. Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be like we, the way we dress, especially. Yeah. We try to dress down like they did before they were before they were signed or before they get on the road and did the costumes. We do like it almost looks like we we made homemade because you know how like Kiss did that. They did like Lydia would would make a t-shirt for Peter or Ace's mom, I think, made a kiss shirt. And so we try to like dress like that instead of the big costumes. We still play all eras of kiss though. You know, we still do like, uh, you know, the seventies or, uh, you know, like stuff off destroyer and love gun, but, but look wise, we tried to downplay it a little bit, which is just a different take on it. Yeah. And when we did the residency at uh, the Rio, um, we incorporated video, history of the band in between songs we would do video history of kiss that's awesome which was made it more broke it up a little bit you know gave the fans who if somebody wasn't real familiar with them it filled them in with the history of the band and stuff so that was kind of cool too um yeah i'm a huge huge kiss fan i got a big kiss tattoo that we're doing on my back a yeah big portrait you piece. sure it's yeah. pretty pretty wild yeah i uh, my buddy ray ever saw up in oregon has been doing that for me i fly up once a year and he does a different face oh really yeah so That's now we're wild. getting ready to do some background i actually i'm thinking it, uh we'll probably start on the uh the other side of my my back because it went down one shoulder right right we're doing star wars on the other side yeah, yeah. so are you gonna put the emperor on your back yeah i want to do like a darth vader with the emperor kind of in his helmet like emperor's cloak meets darth yeah. vader's helmet kind of mash thing that would be bitch and fill sure. the whole thing up with black and stars around them all and smoke and like the background will be the same yeah it's like your whole childhood on your back yeah <laughs> it's gonna be awesome man total dorky ass like portrait piece very but yeah, cool. I love Kiss, man, and the history of Kiss stuff is that's a that's a big perk for me whenever I'm going to a show if I can learn another tidbit about Kiss. Right, I'm super right. down. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, like I said, I was born in '71, so my first memories is like going to my my friend uh, Michael Burke's house, and he had like all the posters on his walls, and he was cranking alive, and and I was just like totally taken by it. And then next thing you know, my bedroom, I used to go, you know, when they had all the magazines at the grocery store, with every one was Kiss. And they had oh, it has a poster in it or two posters in it or a Kiss magazine with all posters, you know. And uh, my whole bedroom was was Kiss, you know. And, and then we used to play the the vinyl. And, and uh, yeah, I was totally obsessed with Kiss, you know. For up until up until Dynasty, I dug Dynasty, yeah. you know. And then once Unmasked came out, I was out. And then I started listening to like Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple big van halen fan i checked out and then once once creatures came out i checked back in i was like oh this is cool again so and then because i was a big eric still am big eric carr fan oh yeah so you know when i heard creatures i heard that drum sound that's right around the time i started playing drums or that's actually what got me interested in playing drums was that album hearing those drums so i love kiss drums Oh yeah, I mean like you know, especially creatures and 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 animal eyes and lick it up and Eric Carr just totally gave that band a kick in the ass. You oh, know? big and, time, man! He's yeah. a hell of a drummer. I love uh, the Kiss Alive and Kiss Alive Two, uh, where Peter Chris is just uh, it's basically one two three drum fill, one two three <laughs> drum fill. Yeah, that's one of the, my favorite things to play on drums if I just want to you know smash some skins real quick man it's just put on kiss alive and just have have at it man sure sure a, yeah super good time i used to crank i used to get uh my sister used to teach jazzercise so she had 
uh, a record player with two speakers that were really loud because she had to teach a class, you know, and it'd be loud enough for the whole room. And I used to crank Kiss Alive and play my drums. I don't know how my parents, God bless them, you know, uh, I don't know how they put up with it because, because <laughs> the house we had at the time, I was on the second floor. Eventually I got smart and I went to the basement, but I was on the second floor, so you had this loud stereo and drums you know, blasting on the second floor of the house. And then my mom's downstairs cooking, you know, making sauce, whatever. And it's like, I don't know how they put up with it. I don't know if I could have <laughs> as a parent. <laughs> uh, well, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Van Halen. And I know you do a uh, Van Halen tribute band back east. Yeah, yeah. This started um, back in 1994. Uh, my friend Rob Neubauer, we played in, a, he, we and him were in, in our first band together in 1986. We had a band called Stormbringer. And we uh, uh, we played Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, uh, White Snake, a lot of the same kind of genre, and a couple of Van Halen songs here and there. But so me and Rob, we, we, we've been friends ever since then, and um, we started a, a Kiss tribute band in '94, and we we basically played in all upstate New York, Pennsylvania, and um, and uh, we're still together. We st when I go home every year, because uh, I'm from Niagara Falls, New York, we do a reunion show. And uh, usually it's a great turnout and stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm also a huge Van Halen fan. You know, I mean, I, I saw them. Uh, my, my second concert, my first concert was Loverboy. Oh, I love Loverboy. <laughs> which I'm kind of embarrassed to say that. But <laughs> oh, that's awesome, At 13 man. years old, I was just happy to go to any <laughs> concert, you know. Yeah. So, so I love Loverboy. And then uh, I was, I was uh, 12 years old, and this is when Jump came out. Right. That's when I kind of really started getting into Van Halen. I, you know, I, I was, uh, I fell for the cheesy stuff right away with Jump, but uh, then I went back and bought the other albums. But uh, there was, on Channel 13, there was a contest, and it was like, send in a postcard, and you you can win two front row center tickets to see Van Halen. You know, this was a 1984 tour, and uh, so I did. And, part, and I've never won really anything in my life. And part of me thinks I was the only one that sent a postcard in, in my mind. <laughs> so I came up from school one day and my mom was home. And I was like, she used to always come home after me. And I was like, why are you home? And she's like, because of you. And I thought I was in trouble. I started thinking, what, what did I do? You know, did I, did I get caught, you know, doing something with a girl in high school, in the back, you know, room of high school? Or did I caught smoking a joint? So um, she goes, you won the Van Halen contest. I go, wow really she's like yeah we had to go pick up the tickets so and for a second i thought i got to meet the band but i did but it's <laughs> it was good enough so my brother's like you know you can go but you got to bring your brother and all right my brother was cool because he's nine years older than me and uh so we got a limo that picked us up at our house and drove us to plus it was free dinner at a place called the cloister restaurant oh nice in buffalo new york it was like a steak lobster steak you know turf surf and turf kind of place so we got free dinner limo picked us up at our house took us to the restaurant um as we're sitting down i look up and rick james comes walking in with wow. with a tall blonde chick right so so i'm take water real quick yeah bro so I'm like, Joe, my brother, I go, it's Rick James. He's like, go ask him for an autograph, you know, before he gets his food, before he starts eating. So I walk over, you know, I'm 12 years old. Hey, Mr. James, can I have your autograph? Yeah, man. He signed a napkin for me, and I wish I still had it. You know, oh, you know oh I don't know what gosh. happened to it. So I got to meet Rick James, and come to find out, he was going to the concert, too. He was going to see Van Halen that night, because somebody online said he was in the sound booth watching them that night. So... Uh, so yeah, so we got right up front, man. We're you know right there, and like for a twelve year old, that was mind blowing to see your hero. Oh yeah, you know, and they were in their prime at that time. And about halfway through the show, I'm watching. I got my hand up, and Eddie comes down, and he gives me a wink, and he put a pick in my hand, and people are trying to get the pick from me, right? Of course, so I grab it, put it in my pocket, and I held on to that pick the whole show. And he, he went like this, you know, winked and gave me a thumbs up. And like, I was like, you know, high for like a month after that. You know, Eddie Van Halen gave me a pick. I still have that pick too at my house. I still have the ticket stub in the pick. Ah, oh, bro. And it's, it's yellowing. You know, it was white, but it's yellowing now. But I still have it, so I saved it. That's awesome. You got in a, you got it in a frame or anything nice like yeah, that on display? Yeah, I have it framed at home with the ticket stub and an and a 8x10 of them from that tour. So... Yeah, I, I think I gave my brother one too. He probably, I, I, nobody, like nobody, 
Like, I'm very nostalgic. You are too. I know you should got a lot of stuff, autographs. Yeah. I'm the same way. I save almost everything if it's something cool or means something to me. But like uh, like my friend Jamie, he doesn't save anything. And I, the other day I said to him, because he's planning on coming out. I've lived here 26 years. He's my best friend in the world. Like, he hasn't come out yet. He's afraid to fly, kind of. So, uh, so I said, hey, do you still have that VHS tape from when we played, you know, some, some gig? No, I can't. I don't know what happened to it. But, like, I have every show I've ever played at home on VHS or transferred to DVD. You know, I just keep that stuff. I have, like, a library of photos, videos. I'm just very nostalgic like that. But a lot of people aren't, so. Yeah, I actually found some uh, two shows that I played when I was a teenager playing metal and all this uh, back in the day. Right. They were on old VHS tapes yep. when I moved recently. Uh-huh. And so I, I converted them to digital here in the studio, and uh, I, I I need to put them online or something like that yeah, so everyone could see them. for sure. Yeah, but it was fun, man, seeing myself play when I was like 16, 17 years old. Yep. That's, it's, it's, it's it takes you back. Yeah. And then you think, man, time goes fast. Because you remember it like so yesterday, fast. you know? Um, oh, yeah. I remember we were playing, uh, what was it? We got to play inside of a Tower Records back when there were still Tower Records. Yeah. And they were selling our CDs as an independent in and Vegas? Yeah, out in uh, California. Okay. And uh, and then our fans trashed the place, and they <laughs> took our CDs down, right? I went in the next day to, like, buy a CD from Tower Records yeah. of my you know, my CD. I thought it would be the coolest thing to go right. and buy my own CD when I was a kid. Right. And they had them all in the back, and they were pissed <laughs> at us. Where did they, they trash yeah. the store? Yeah. We told them, man. Like, they put, they put, like, a thing of CDs right in front of us when we were going to play. They were, like, put a display out, like, you know, of, like, Top 40s right. crap. Whatever they, you know, they were trying to sell CDs to our fans, and I was just like, "That's gonna get destroyed." I was like, "There's gonna, they're gonna start bumping shoulders and moshing." Right, right, right. And uh, try to warn them. Yeah, I was, I was real upfront about it. And they're like, "Well, they better not." And I was like, "Well, what do you want me? To, I mean, we right. can tell them not to mosh, but they're gonna mosh, man. That's right. what people do at a metal show." Right. And sure as shit, they they ended up throwing that rack across the store and trashing the whole store. <laughs> CDs are flying everywhere, oh, and there's man. so many like underage kids surrounding the building, just getting drunk and high the whole night. And yeah, they were pissed at us, man. I it, bet. it lasted one day. You had wild, wild fans, yeah. crazy fans. Metal, man. You know. Yeah. Freaking yeah. What are you gonna do? What year was that about? Um, I want to say like. 2000 2001 probably like okay like real early 2000s because i was like 16 17 so yeah i'd be about 2001 maybe and uh yeah that's all we were doing is getting fucked up and playing metal every weekend that's yeah, all there was to do fun. yeah, yeah. Moshing. I was always too small in the mosh. I never got nowhere near the mosh pit. Oh, yeah. you know no, i'll get hurt i know that i'll end up with a broken arm or something and you know that's what happens. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it does. Black eyes, broken nose, teeth missing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't got time for that. <laughs> I remember there was a uh, there was a punk rock show when I was a kid, and uh, at the punk rock shows, like they, the the bands would rent out like a small auditorium, uh-huh. and they were doing their own security and everything. So nobody's taking chains, no one's taking spikes, and so everyone's in full punk rock gear, and they're moshing. And this kid had a one of those huge metal shoulder pad spikes go right in his friggin' oh eye. God. And I didn't really? take his eye out or anything. It, like, slid. But you, you see him out, just blood pouring out of his eye socket. And, and that's like, fun to him, huh? Yeah, <laughs> and he's just so proud of himself. Metal, you know, or punk rock, whatever it was at yeah. the time. Yeah. Not testosterone going on. No, it's, that, that, it's crazy. It's dangerous, man. It sounds it's like it, dangerous. yeah. I go to a concert to... You know, I I I can rock out. I like to have a good time and, and enjoy the energy of of the band. But I don't want to end up in the hospital after a show. Oh yeah, <laughs> and now I uh, now I sit in the back behind front of house and I have a seat. <laughs> yeah, I'm like I want a seat, man. Like yeah. I'm not interested in standing up for three or four hours. My knees can't take it anymore. Absolutely, I know. I I and I love to be able to see. You know, it's like that's one thing about the House of Blues here in Vegas. Yeah, it's like if you if you're not sitting down. And you're like me, like five seven. You got to stand in the back, and in the elevated section to see the stage, because just you know, there's always some dude that's like six four in front of me. Oh know? yeah. You know, no matter what show I go, I'm like trying to look around them. So. Especially the House of Blues here in Vegas, they have all right. those pillars. 
Yeah. And like, just if you're on the floor, man, it's almost impossible to see the show. Even I'm six two. It's it's a pain in my ass to yeah. see the show. I love the balcony. That's why the balcony rules there. Yeah, the balcony is really great. The sound is good. You see, looking down on the band, it's really cool. You know, I always try to get balcony seats if I can. Yeah, if they have it open, a lot of times they ended up uh, closing the balcony off just to yeah make sure everybody's compacted into the, right. the lower area. They want it to look full. It's better to look full than to sell seats. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I spent a lot of years working at the House of Blues, actually, when I first moved out here. Uh, what did you do there? I was an audio engineer. Okay. Just do, like do you remember, um, did you know any security guys? Uh, yeah, I knew of, of several of the security team. Do you know Jim, Jim Nunnery? You know Jim? That he, does sound familiar. Like big goatee, shaved head kind of guy. Yeah, I think I did know Jim Nunnery, man. Yeah, he, uh, he was, worked there for a while. Yeah? He's from my hometown, but he lived out here. But I knew him from back home, so I know he worked there for a while, just... I thought maybe you knew him. Probably. I'm terrible with names, and I was still drinking back then, so it was, uh, yeah, it was all a blur, man. Yep. We would just get, we would just drink all day and smoke weed in the parking lot, and, like, no one cared, and it was right. a rock club. Right. And that was kind of half the reason you work at in that industry is so you can just party all day and right. put on concerts and not care. and Turn a few so. dials. Yeah. Get back, you know. Push gear on and off stage, and. Go have a beer. <laughs> That's a nice job. It's a laid back job. You know, not too many rules or anything, right? It sucks oh, yeah. work for a casino. There's so many rules. You can't do anything. Oh, yeah. They're always so concerned about getting sued or, uh, you know, they sh you're just a commodity, really. They're, they have so many employees that oh, there's yeah. no personal vibe to working at a casino, man. Or you got to, you know, you got to, like, and for a while, you can't even, like, they didn't want you to fold your arms behind the bar because it, it sends the customer signal that you're closed, that you're not, you know, oh, welcoming yeah. them. And it's like, are you kidding me? Come on. You know, yeah. this guy's this guy's vomiting on the cr on the ground over here, and you really think at the, in the lounge, you really think he cares when my arms folded? <laughs> you know what it is? Is uh, somebody complained at one point that someone was standing with their arms behind right, the bar, right. and then they had to come up with the rule to appease the customers because yep. they're there to make money. You know, they want to keep the customer happy. Yeah, and everyone's always trying to find something to complain about. Yeah, especially if they think they can get something for free. Yeah, you know. And like when they walk up to the bar and they have one of those certain type of comp, like the, that they, they got from like a, a manager or from a pit boss, you know that person's a jerk. It's like you complain to get that, you know. <laughs> there's different types of comps. There's ones that they got from, you know, uh, you're, I already don't like you, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's that That's that life. We used to always sit um, at uh, Mandalay Bay, the bar right across the street from the House of Blues. We'd like to hang out at that bar in the between. Jackalope? Oh, well, the Jackalope for sure. I yeah. used to go there for Dollar Coronas all the time. Yeah, a lot of employees from Mandalay Bay used to go there. Yeah, I love the Jackalope. The Laughing Jackalope. I don't know what happened to the Laughing Jackalope. That building's still closed. Yeah, and that's a great location for, they should make that a rock club. Yeah, they something. should. It'd it's be big great, enough. Yeah, it would be a great location for that. Yeah. No, we would sit across the sports book bar, though. The one where there's okay. the bridge to the Luxor. Yeah. And that bridge to the Luxor is just prime, like, people-watching traffic, where uh -huh. all the bachelorette parties are just stumbling all over themselves, <laughs> especially when we're getting off work, you know, the concert's over, and it's, like, 2 in the morning. Yeah. Everyone's just shit-faced, and they don't know which direction's up. Right, right. And you can just hang out and have a beer there and watch the disaster of people that are like, we're going to go, we're going to kick Vegas' ass and tear a show oh, yeah. how to party, and it's just like, yeah, good luck with that, bud. Yeah, I've... <laughs> I've I've worked in Mandalay for twenty. It'll be twenty two years, man. I've seen I've seen a lot of crazy stuff. I've oh, seen, I bet. I mean, it's it's like the last line. I think it is in in uh, the Hangover. Some people just can't handle Vegas. That's so true. Oh you yeah. Know? People come here, they just lose their minds. You know. They think they're here, and it gives them the right to be a total dick. Right. And right. they're just like, I'm going to be the biggest jerk in the world. And it's, it's like, you know, you know. You wouldn't go anywhere else and do that. No, you wouldn't. You know, it's, I understand, you know, it's a party town, but, you know, you don't got to be full on mor moron, you know, when you come here. I think they see too many movies, and then people are acting like jerks in movies, and, trying, and they're yep. just trying to outdo the movies and outdo the, uh, the outrage and the... Uh, Absolutely. The extremities of, of their party and that they've seen on TV. They want to relive the hangover when they come here. Yeah, you know, exactly. They want to live like that. You know, it's, it's funny. 
Yeah, and uh, it just makes you look like a dick. You're <laughs> exactly. Just, you're just way too drunk. You're drunker than you can handle, and you're you're acting like a complete fool. I got, I got a quick story for you. It's um, I was working one night at the bar, and this guy comes up to the bar, and he has a paper cup, about half full with hot chocolate in it, right? And the only way you're going to get a paper cup is from a cocktail waitress. We don't when we see, when you buy a drink at the bar, we give glass, you know. Yeah. So he goes, uh. I, my girl didn't like this. I want to exchange it for something. I go, well, sir, I said, you, she got that from a waitress, and, you know, I can't exchange it. You'd have to talk to the waitress, you know. And he gets pissed off, and he's like, um, he goes, well, uh, just just let me buy a 7-7 seven, seven and whatever, a Corona. And it can't, you know, drinks are expensive nowadays. And, oh, yeah. And so it was like 20-something, like 25 bucks, 26 bucks. So I go, it'll be $26, sir. And he starts swearing at me about the prices. So I go, you know what, sir? Now I'm not serving you nothing. I said, you're, you're swearing at me. You're done. You're cut off. I take the drinks. Keep swearing. So I call security, right? Security ends up walking this guy out of the building. And and I didn't see this now because they were already gone. But as, as he was walking out with his girl, his girl must have said something to him. She called him a name or something. You're a jerk, you know? And he smacked her. So security grabs this guy, throws him, throw him to the ground. This is before, like, it's different now. You can't do certain things like that anymore. But this is like maybe like 12, 13 years ago. Threw the guy to the ground. The guy he bumps his head, cuts his head open. They put him in a holding tank because now he's going to jail. And so, so I'm thinking this guy is sitting in a holding tank. And he was crying, crying with a bloody head, all because of, of half a hot chocolate he didn't like. It's yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the kind of stuff that. Because he had to be a dick. Right, right. You know, you know he couldn't have just he went to the waitress and said, can I get another one, please? You know, here's a buck. Can I get another drink? You know, it's that simple. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, people are crazy, man. And uh, and I'm not I'm not excluded from that, you know. I've been a complete asshole plenty of times in my life. I try not to be anymore. I try right. to be more aware of what you know my behavior, especially in public. I'm sure but, alcohol was involved, right? Yeah, a lot, <laughs> a lot, you know. But uh, yeah, I had to. That's why I stopped doing that shit, man. It was, yeah. uh, it was out of control. I used to love it too, man. It was my favorite thing. It's like half the reason I became an audio engineer was so I could drink at work. Really? Which, when I wanted a gig that I could party all day, and I was like, oh well, it's like, make a living. I make a living, and yeah. I can just you know. What did you drink? What was your drink of choice? Uh, I liked whiskey a lot, and I also liked Jägermeister a lot. Ooh. And uh, those two just get you really messed up really you, you quick. You mixed them? You drink both? I would drink whatever. It just depended on the night. You know, some nights would be Jaeger night, some nights would be a whiskey night. Jeez. And, uh, but it almost always turned into a Jaeger night because yeah. you, Jaeger mixes really well with energy drink. And so once you start it feeling it and you're like, you know, you're like three bands in and you've been drinking all night, it's like, let's start Goes doing Jaeger easy. bombs and... Yeah. Yeah. Then you get all jacked up on energy drinks. You don't know where you are. You're blacked out, but your body's still it's moving like on autopilot. Downer and upper at the same time. Yeah. Right? Dangerous, man. Yeah, for sure. I, I I can drink Jaeger a little bit. I'm not a big Jaeger guy. I, I I like it, like you said, with with a Red Bull. Yeah. Or um, what was the one drink with with Mal? It was Malibu pineapple Jaeger. I forgot that was what that was called, but those are pretty easy to drink. But um. What about whiskey, like like American whiskey, Canadian whiskey, or bourbon? When do you when did you like in that department? I uh, I like Scotch a lot, man. Really, I was big into the Macallan and Glenlivet and stuff like straight that. Straight or on the rocks? Yeah, rock. straight. Wow. Uh, sometimes I'd have it with a little splash of water. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, I was real into the Scotch thing. But uh, for the most part, I mean, that was towards the end. Like, for really, I was drinking Jack Daniels, you know, rock and roll stuff. <laughs> and then I remember uh, when I. But, when I was at beauty bar, beauty bar is where I started really going, I got to stop drinking so much. And I yeah. do the three months sober and then fall off the wagon and then, you know, yeah. four months sober, fall off the wagon game until you it finally cool figure place. it out. Yeah. And we would drink uh, everything at that place, man. They would just be ma- mixing all kinds of fruity cocktails and you can't taste the alcohol at all. And they right. just be, you know, there's, there's, there's no bar tab for the sound guy and they're just bringing you the booze constantly try this try this try this try right. this try this is that uh, place still open no it got shut down man did they have live bands there too oh yeah that's what that? i was doing there okay it was live bands so we'd have um 
They have that big space in the back. Yeah, that's what I remember. It was, most. It was basically in an alley with a fence blocking the right. homeless people from creeping in. But they'd still get in, man. Yeah, they'd you know? still <laughs> jump the fence or whatever. Or... Oh yeah, they'd find a way in, you know. Yeah. And uh, and we'd have security everywhere, but the, you know those, it, you know, we're they're drinking too, so it's not a, it's not a perfect system. It's just a right. big party. We're all young people just partying and and trying to run a club, which is hard. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't treat it like with the respect it deserved. But right. that's why it was so much fun there. Yeah. And uh, no, there was, yeah, so out in the alley, we had a big, uh, big PA system and this shit stage is falling apart. And we put on shows out there. We have big bands out there too, man. Okay. Because I, I was only at that place once or twice and I, I don't think there was ever a band there when I, when I was there. Oh, yeah. Some, but I wasn't in there a lot. I was only there once. You know, we were downtown. We just popped in. Just check it out. But I remember that area in the back. I remember that. Yeah, they are, that was fun, man. And uh, and we had a stage inside, too, for the smaller shows. Uh-huh. So, and, like, the karaoke nights and stuff like that. And, yeah, that was a blast. I loved running that place, man. That was one of the funnest times of my life, dude. Like, I was probably, like, 23, 24, just getting hammered every night. Yeah. And mixing bands. Yeah, you think I was, like, thinking, living the dream. Sure, sure. And hoping it didn't end. Yeah. You know, I could do this forever. You know, my whole career would just be doing this. Yeah, which is not, I mean, you can do it. I know guys that, that did take that path and continue to, you know, they're 50, 60-year-old sound guys, and they're still yeah. just drinking every night and, and living it up. But, uh, yeah, I had, to, I had to stop. I was getting bad. It was it was out of freaking control Your body starts to tell you. Yeah. That, you know, this isn't good. You got to slow down or whatever. Oh, yeah. I was blacking out every night and still driving home like an <laughs> really? idiot. Yeah, I, I was, thankfully, I never got a DUI That's or anything. Question. Yeah, never, never really, uh, I, I, I was able to stop before it really fucked up too much. I mean, it did fuck up some things, some things in my life, and, but uh, I got out of it soon enough to where yeah. I was able to recover from it and really realize the folly of my ways. I was right. bad. N- not that everybody should quit drinking. I just some, you know, like me, I was, I like you. It. I'm an all it. or nothing kind of cat. Right. So right. it was a lot of fun, and I'd take it too far every freaking night. So do you do you not drink at all now, or? or yeah, no, not at all now. It's, it's good. Ten, almost ten years in September, man. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it was, uh, and I, I love it. I was gonna, I was gonna, uh, like the whole way to this ten year mark coming up in September. I was always like, once I hit ten years. That'll I'll prove my point to myself, and I'll uh, establish self control, and I won't drink anymore. Right. And now that that's right around the corner, and it's just like, uh, you know, in the back of my head, it's like, well, you said you can drink after ten years, and I'm just like, not interested. Right. <laughs> like, right. Do you don't crave it or anything anymore? Do you? No, not really. That's good. Man. That's good. Not really. You probably feel better. I'm oh sure yeah. You feel up. Feel more great, energy man. and work out every day and uh, eat healthy and and you know try that's to great. stay stay clean, man. And it's. It's totally the fu- it's the way to do it, man. For me personally, not right. for everybody. You know, I definitely don't want to be that preachy guy right. who uh, right. tries to convince people to be sober or anything like that. That's ridiculous, man. Yeah, it's each person has to to do it for themselves. They have to make their own decision. What's yeah. you know come to their own. Because I I'm a drinker, but I I don't I don't get drunk every time I drink. But I'm a consistent drinker. You know what I mean? Like like when I get off work, uh, I have to have a drink. You know, yeah, and I have to have a glass of wine, and, and but most of the time it's with food. You know, I have my meal after work, or whatever, and I have a glass of wine or two or three. But there's, usually it's always with food. But um, I just don't like the hangovers anymore, so I really don't. I try not to get drunk anymore. I try and like if I drink like beer, I'll get full before I get drunk. But but I just like yeah. I like the taste. I like the taste of it. I like the taste of beer. I like the taste of wine. You know, but yeah, I used to love. Um, I even still uh, very. Very occasionally, I'll still have like a non-alcoholic every once in a while. If it's like a party and everyone's drinking, you know, or whatever, yeah, I'll, I'll grab like a six-pack of non-alcoholic beer and then I'll leave those five leave five beers with my friends. Yeah, and I have like the one. Have and you tried the Heineken zero point zero? I was about to say those are bomb. Joe Rogan was drinking them on his podcast. Yeah, and uh, I was doing either Buckler or St. Pauli Girl, uh-huh. uh, which are both delicious NAs. Uh, but the Heineken Zero, man, that tastes... It's probably one of the best tasting yeah. non-alcoholic beers. What I remember a Heineken to taste tasted like, uh-huh. that's what it tastes like. It tastes just like an alcoholic Heineken. Because we just got those in the other day at, at my bar. So we're like, let's try it, you know, because it's no alcohol, so we can drink it. Yeah. We cracked it. We drink, you know, a little sip, each of us. And I'm like, wow, that's that's a pretty good tasting NA because some of those NAs taste pretty nasty. Yeah, they have this weird, like, sweet Aftertaste. kind of... 
it doesn't taste like a beer. It tastes like you're trying to be a beer. Right. And right. it's like, I don't want something to taste like it's almost a beer. Right. And I want so. it to taste like beer. Yeah. What, what's funny is my buddy, uh, my buddy Tracy Buckler, he, he used to be, he's, he's sober now too, which is great because he was a big partier and uh, he used to drink a lot, you know? And I went in his garage. He's got a big Buckler banner. Oh, that's cool. Oh, it's a non-alcoholic beer. It's yeah. not cool to have that. You're, you know, because it's your name, but it's not alcoholic. It doesn't fit you. <laughs> so it's like the irony of that was just, you know, hilarious. But, but now, now I guess it's, it's relevant now because he's sober. So that's funny. Yeah, the, those bucklers are pretty good, man. I really liked those. But yeah, that was always the the biggest problem too. Whenever I uh, I was trying to quit, you know, and in the the early days of it, and it was still fresh, everyone's just like, "Oh man, th- that's bullshit." I love drinking with you. You're so much fun when you yeah. party and everything. And it's just like, nah, uh, you know. It makes it difficult for you. You know, it's almost like peer pressure. Oh, know? it's tons of it, man. Tons of it. And yeah, so it's uh, yeah. But I was sick of waking up with a hangover. I remember uh, realizing I didn't remember what it was like to wake up without a hangover at a certain point because yeah. it was just every it was because i every night i walk into work it was uh they would just hand me booze like right through the door i haven't even put my bag Soon down yet there. and they're like it's jason he's an alcoholic and here's here's <laughs> booze for jason he loves booze we'll make jason happy and so i was it was constant it yeah. was a constant thing in my life man until and you're at the things you can't just say i'm I'm going to hold off. Right. Because then it's like every night, it's like, oh, well, it's my birthday, though, you know? There's always an occasion yeah. or something. Did you, did you get to the point where you had to drink to feel normal? Yeah, that was it. I mean, yeah. I had to drink to feel not hungover. Right. Because right. it was like I'd wake up just sloshed from the night before and just pounding headache. And usually I'd roll over and drink whatever I had passed out, like warm beer oh. sitting next to my bed. Oh, just to feel like get my head straight. Just to get right. Yeah. And then yeah. I'm like, okay, like, let's... That's why they call Try it a fix. coffee. Yeah, exactly. Need a fix. I gotta fix myself. Oh yeah. Well, that's what a. Uh, I guess that's what a hangover is. Is um, your body is having withdrawals immediately from uh-huh. becoming addicted to the alcohol right away. It's such really? an addictive substance that you go straight into withdrawals uh, in one day of partying. Wow. Yeah. And so that's what a hangover actually is. Is you going through withdrawals. That's why it fixes it right away. You have a beer right. and you're hungover and. Hair of the dog. Yeah, and you, you feel great again. It's because you're you're kicking that withdrawal symptom off. Right. And, uh, yeah, I learned that later on. Um, but that that's, it makes so much sense. Yeah, sure. It's brutal. But yeah, it was a lot of fun, though. I don't regret any of it, man. Hey, I'm glad I did it. That's what you do when you're young. Yeah. You do it and, and you get out of it, and, you know, and, and you learn, you know, now, now you can enjoy your life and be healthy and... But you got those memories. That's what you do when you're at that age. You party, oh, yeah. you know. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it for anything, man. I had such a blast doing that crazy sure. ass lifestyle and living it up. And now it's just like, uh, you know, since I did it, I'm not like, oh, I missed out on something or right. I wish I could go do that. But now I'm, you know, right. I'm in my mid 30s and I can't really hang like that anymore. It's no like, regrets. No regrets, man. No regrets at all. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. No, but yeah, man. Uh, what else is going on? <laughs> <laughs> you play with uh, you play with some pretty uh, big names as well. Uh, Frank Domino of Angel and Oz Fox Frank. and Striper, right? You do yeah. the vinyl tattoo thing. Yeah, that's that was the the first um, the first band that kind of brought me back into playing again because uh, I, I lost the passion for a while, you know, and and plus I was working nights. So I'm like, and the music scene wasn't that great in Vegas for a while. So there was really nowhere to really play. Um, I didn't know any musicians or anything. Um, so, and I was working nights. So I'm like, it's pointless, you know? So um, I met my fiance back in 2011 and she was like, you know, you're a good drummer. You should be playing. I don't know, you know? And, and it just ha- so happened that um, somebody turned me on to Frank Domino. They're like, this guy is looking for a drummer with their band. So I called Frank and Frank was like, uh, I'm going to send you a set list, learn them, learn them good and come down and we'll jam. So I went down to rehearsal place and Oz was there, Oz Fox Striper and Frank was there and JP Michaels and, and we played and it sounded great. And then we started rehearsing like two, three times a week and we started playing out. And there's a, 
yeah, we were together for about a year, and, and then then I left to do other things, and they got another drummer, and they lasted, I think, another year after that. And then, then I think Strepper got back together, and Angel started to get back together, so so they moved on and did their own thing, too. Oh, really? You guys aren't doing that no more, huh? No, that band, I think only lasted, only lasted a couple of years, and it's because Strepper wasn't doing anything. Yeah. They are like in a hiatus, and Angel was done. And then um, as soon as we kind of broke that band up the opportunities came along for for striper again and uh so they got back together and they went back in the studio i think they released like two or three albums since then because this was uh 2012 uh i was with them for 2012 to, to 2013 okay and they lasted maybe another year after that and then that's when all the other guys started doing their own thing again so it was fun though there's there's on youtube there's some really cool videos of me playing with them and uh, we rehearsed a lot, so we were we were pretty tight as a band, and, and uh, we sounded great together. Oz is just a, an amazing guitar player. Oh yeah, you know, he makes it so easy to play with him because he's so, you know, he's just a very uh, uh, aggressive type player, and you can lock. I could lock in with him very easily. You know, JP was a great bass player too, so it was e easy for me because they were already rehearsing together, the three of them, and I think they went through a couple drummers. So when I slid in. They were already tight as a unit, so I just locked right in with them, and it, it was easy, you know. Yeah, that was a hell of a band. I mixed you guys a bunch of times. Yeah, at, you were there. Uh, huh? Vamped. Yeah, and Frank Domino is an amazing singer, man. I Absolutely. Mean, some crazy. You, know, you guys would do like Deep Purple and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, Highway Star. Yeah. I remember that specifically because I was like, is he really about to do Highway yeah. Star? Yeah. And Dio, he would nail Dio too. Oh yeah. Um, it's funny because I remember one time him and Oz came over my house. And I was using my V drums, and we were having a quiet practice, like, you know, because neighbors and stuff. And Oz had a small amp, and I had the V drums, and I had an amplifier so he could control the volume. And Frank didn't even, he didn't even sing through a mic. He was just singing in the room, and yeah. it was like, like, he was blasting just the power of his voice. And I'm thinking, man, I bet you my neighbors can hear him singing, you know, five <laughs> houses down. So, yeah, he, he's very powerful and a great guy. You know, him and Cindy, I love, we, my girl and I, we... We uh, go over there for Thanksgiving and stuff to Frank and Cindy's house. They're really cool people. They're very nice people. So. Oh, yeah. And Oz, too, man. Oz, Oz is a really too. great guy. And JP's Absolutely. a great guy. That was a killer band. Yeah. yeah. You guys were awesome, man. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun, too. You know, it's just, just in, in this town, it's, everybody gets distracted. There's so many other things going on that it's hard to keep a unit together, you know? It really is, man. Yeah, it really is. I uh, I had a few projects myself in town, and uh, you know they, they last a few years, and then it kind of just disintegrates. Right. There's only a couple projects out there that really have been around for friggin' ever, man. Right. You know? And right. Uh, yeah, the, the other thing is, is so many so many talented people that they end up having to go to other things, either yeah. a show in town or back on the road with their old band that they're famous for, and yeah, so uh, it's kind of crazy, man. People just you know too many opportunities i guess and there's and, and there's so many musicians in one area that there's always people starting a new band or ne or ne need like subs you know like hey like somebody just asked me today you know i need a drummer for for this day can you do it and it's like it's great when those when those okay, those opportunities come along you know because it keeps you working but um yeah vegas is a, is a cool place for for music and i think it's gotten a lot better over the years you know, because like when I moved here in 1995, there was nothing. There was no music scene. There was, I mean, there was, um, remember Pinkies? Did you ever hear of Pinkies? I think that was just a little before my time. Yeah. It was like a, it was a, a bar restaurant, but they had live bands and like, like the original Quiet Riot played there. Oh, like, wow. Like, not the original, but, but, you know, the mental health lineup, you yeah. know, Rudy Sarzo, Carlos Cabazzo. But, um, they played there and stuff. So it was a really cool place, but it didn't last that long. There was a place called the Palladium. I saw Skid Row there in 95. That was right towards the end of their, you know, before Sebastian left. Yeah. So there was a couple places, but for the most part, there really wasn't a music scene here. You know, it was a lot of lounge bands and stuff. So it's gotten a lot better over the last 20 years or whatever. Yeah, hopefully... Um Hopefully, as we're coming out of the, the pandemic, and I know a lot of venues ended up shutting down uh, because of it. 
yeah. which is expected. You know, I'm just, I'm really glad to hear that that Vamped is still open. Me too. That was such a great venue for the local scene. Absolutely. And, uh, and like new places like Rockstar Bar uh, and Grill on Las Vegas Boulevard, they're opening right. up and providing a similar style environment for the rock for and roll community. Play. Yeah. And I know I've been doing the dive bar. I did a bunch of uh, remodeling for the dive bar sound system. That's one place so, I haven't been yet. Yeah, it's uh, it's a rough, you know, crazy place, but uh, it's my favorite. It's my favorite bar. I, it? I don't drink, and I'll still go hang out at dive bar. I gotta check it out. I have to get down there. Yeah, Vamped is still my favorite. I like Vamped. It's a great place, man. Yeah. Good food and you know, fantastic system, fantastic stage, fantastic people. It's got a great vibe. To yeah, it, it does. Know? And it's nice that they keep it running like that. I know right. uh, that place has got a, it's a huge overhead kind of thing to keep that place alive. And uh, I know they're not, they're not breaking in dough over there. And I'm surprised and they, they made it through. They still keep it open. Yeah, which is great because that's a great place to play. It's a great place for bands. I'm surprised they made it through the pandemic. I, you know, I'm glad they did, but it's, it's you know, they, every place must have taken a big hit. Oh, yeah. You know, everybody did. Well, you know, it's, you know, Danny Coker with counting cars and, yeah. and counts customs and everything is really what's keeping that place alive, right. man. You know, he's Danny, such a cool guy too. He's a great person, man. He's just like he is on TV. You know, he's yeah, very laid back, normal guy. You know, yeah. Everybody used to ask me about that, man. They're like, oh, what's uh, and it's like he just literally walks on camera and is that's that's who that's he is. Him. That's Absolutely. him being himself. He's just a really generous, nice dude. Yeah. So thankfully, he was able to keep that place afloat. I was worried about that bar because uh, that's a great place for the, for the Las Vegas like Absolutely. local music scene as well as like touring bands to be able to come through. Yeah. And hopefully, we see some other venues coming out. I know. Uh, I know. I got a big PA ready to go. To Do go you? push in it, put in a spot, yeah. Um, that w- I was talking when the when everything like when everything shut down, I was actually invested in a small club downtown that we were going to start doing stuff, and uh, and we never got a show off. But uh, yeah. I, I was I had all the equipment and I kept it all so that I could put it in a new spot, or if that club ends up opening back up, right? But uh, yeah, anything to keep the. There's so many good, talented musicians out here, man. So For sure. Got to keep that scene alive. You definitely want to have a shortage of, of bands or people that want to play there. If you open a place, there's going to be a lot of people ready to go. Oh, yeah. Um, whatever happened to, um, do you remember Backstage Bar and Billiards? Yeah, that tr- uh, Triple B's, right, is what they yeah. would call it. What happened to that place? That place is actually, wor- it's it's operating. It was really? operating even before, like, the restrictions were lifted. They found a way to get th- around by having private events. Okay. So like I was downtown with some friends showing them around and uh, and I couldn't believe I heard live music coming out of that place. Yeah. And I tried to get in and they were like, you had to be on like a private thing from right. Facebook and you had to show up with your COVID test results. And they're like, okay. they were jumping through so many friggin' hoops yeah. to put live music on. But they were able to make it through as well. You got to give them credit for, so, for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they have, um, what's his name? Is it Car- Big Daddy Carlos? I think, or something like, is it is involved with that? Okay, and he's got you know he's got he's one of those guys that's got money to back the place even through tough times. Right, I think that's what it really takes. So they're still they're still having bands play there and stuff right now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're still rocking as we speak. I can look yeah. it up real quick. Uh, sure. And yeah, that was another place had a great dressing room. They gave us like a whole floor. I remember the dressing room being really big and accommodating yeah i like that dressing room over there man it was uh we had some good times we uh, played there as cracker man and oh yeah enjoyed that dressing room quite a bit with some of our buddies (laughs) so yeah no they got tickets uh circus sick i I can pull this up on uh on the thing here boom so circus sick btbam between the berry to me okay Cool, and then just announced. So yeah, they got. There's like three shows right there. Okay. Yeah, and it looks like uh, cool comedian. Oh, I like comedy shows. I don't even go check that out. So. Right on. Good to know that they're still. They're yeah. Still operating. Here's the little front page form there. Yeah, backstage bar and bill. So yeah, cool. and if any other venues pop up, man, I definitely like to keep a, keep everybody posted on what's going on. I don't know if like places like the Cheyenne I, I think that probably Cheyenne Saloon I don't know if that's still open or not I'm I haven't not heard sure. anything about the Cheyenne um, I haven't heard I think uh, I know um, what was it on Fremont Street 
uh, off of the off of Fremont Street though. It was um, uh, then there was another venue over there though. It was like a smaller bar with an outdoor venue that was like on like 11th Street or something like that in Fremont. Um, I never went, I never really went over there, but that was a big place that everyone was playing, and I know they shut down as well. Is th- was um, the Cheyenne Saloon the same as um, Adrenaline? Yeah, Adrenaline. The same was venue, Cheyenne. right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I guess it would be Adrenaline now. I, I don't know if they survived the the pandemic or not, but I'm not uh, sure. I know we lost a we lost a lot of venues, so it's good to see people coming back and 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 hopefully we get some new venues around town and right you know well i can i can tell you just because i've been back to work at mandalay over the last couple weeks and and it's been busy you can tell people are ready to get out and ready to party oh yeah everybody's you can tell they've been cooped up and it's been super busy people are spending money and drinking and so that's been my observation over the last couple weeks so that's a good sign i guess for for vegas you know Oh, people are dying to get out of their houses. Yeah. The first big show we did at Dive Bar, it was the whole parking lot was full of people, and you couldn't walk through the bar. I mean, really? it was just yeah, it was just so many freaking people there that it just it was overwhelming. Yeah, uh, it's great to see that response. Yeah, same thing with the other night. It vamped uh, with the Cincinnati Kiss show. It was it was packed. You yeah, know, it stayed packed all night. Sometimes it thins out as the show you know towards the end of the, the night, but it, it stayed pretty packed the whole night. So that was that was really cool to see that well awesome well i think that's been about an hour yeah we were at, we are at an wow. hour mark and right so and i want to keep it under an hour if i can i know last yeah. week i went a little over so uh <laughs> this has been a great time man I'm yeah i appreciate you, you asking me to do this it was a lot of fun dude it was my pleasure man you've been a fantastic guest i'm talking about star wars and kiss it, i mean it you don't know, get any better than that you don't gotta <laughs> pull my leg to talk about star wars and kiss bro <laughs> So. And drinking and yeah, and partying. this studio, your studio is amazing, man. Well, thank I, you I very much. Say, it's, it's really, really cool. You know? Yeah, well, we are open for uh business, you know. We do records, we do you know, music videos, we do all kinds of stuff, man. So, uh, you can record a whole band here, right? With the, oh, yeah, the V drums and everything, and yeah, I got the I got the V drums, I got the you know, 88 key keyboard, and I got a awesome. There's a uh, ton of, uh, you know, professional instruments, basses and guitars and all kinds of stuff all through the house, man. And it's funny because some people say, oh, yeah, I got a studio in my house. You go there and it's a computer, you know. With, yeah. It's like, dude, this is this is a studio. This is a real studio. So it's it's, it's very cool. Well, thank you, man. Yeah, we got it, dude. All the, like, all the acoustic material was pulled out of uh, Digital Insight Recording Studios. Okay. Uh, and when I remodeled that place forever ago and. I love that place too. That's a cool place. Yeah, I love Digital Insight, man. So, yeah, no, it's a thank you very much, man. I I worked really hard on getting this studio operational, and it's nice to have it back and operational in a new location. Absolutely, and it's great to be back doing uh, this podcast. So, uh, yeah, once again, thank you so much, Carl, thank you, for uh, coming on the podcast. And You're uh, welcome. this has been to the fullest with Jason Froberg. Peace. Take care. Thanks for watching To The Fullest with Jason Froberg. You can check out more podcasts here and subscribe by clicking right here. We air new podcasts every Monday morning on Space Brain Station and all of your favorite podcast apps.